Well, welcome back to SuperCloud 3. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. We're here for a keynote conversation with Russ Davis, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Product Officer of Vicinity. We're going to talk about more and more data being seen in more places, needed for more applications, opportunities for this next gen cloud, the super cloud movement that's happening. And uh, Russ, thanks for coming on theCUBE for this uh, super cloud conversation. Thanks for having me, John. You guys are doing some really interesting things around data and this next gen kind of workflow we're seeing where applications are using data. Um, super compelling, it kind of points to the super cloud tra trajectory and what people are thinking about. But before we get into it, talk about your company. What do you guys do? You guys are in an area that's super growth right now in data. Um, give a quick plug for what you guys are doing and introduce yourself. Sure, so Russ Davis, as you said, I'm the CEO and CPO for Vicinity. Uh, Vicinity was actually created in 2018 it is the reincarnation of a prior company um, uh, called Bay Microsystems that was primarily focused on the federal government. That's where the original funding to develop our technology came from. It's places like the DOD and the intelligence community. Uh, vicinity basically was to take that commercial, right? And start to apply the technology that fundamentally does one of two things. One is we move data across wide area networks faster than any other technology. Um, because of how we do that, we're able to actually enable compute to work with data that is remote from it, okay? And I know that seems like a misnomer <laughs> of some kind, but for many applications that actually works. And if for whatever reason the network isn't big enough or there's just too much data, we go back to the first side of our coin, right? Which is we just then move it to where the compute is. So two, two tracks there, or two sides of the coin. You said mm -hmm. move data to where the app needs to go really fast and cost effectively, which people care about. We'll get that in a second. Sure or move the compute to the data where it lives. That's really the two approaches, right? Fund fundamentally, yes. We're, we're basically um, enabling our customers to utilize their wide area networks almost as part of their storage fabric, right? So we're extending that storage and the data that's sitting there to the compute wherever it sits. So you guys are perfect uh, um, company to point to when you talk about super cloud, when we say super cloud as this new multi-cloud kind of environment exists but also it's not fully optimized. And we're seeing kind of this distributed computing mindset come in uh, sure. with new stuff. We got a tailwind with AI and machine learning. You have new applications, the, the development in open source is booming. So you're going to see an accelerated functionality in this new super cloud. What do you see for super cloud? What's your uh, view? How do you define super cloud and what, why do you like it? Um, so for us, it's, it's, it's great, right? Uh, I mean, look, the clouds really became a big thing because of this whole idea of scale out compute on demand. Right? That's kind of what got them to where they were. And then it was the idea of cheap storage, whether that's true or not, it's a different story. But um, then we see hybrid cloud, multi-cloud, we hear all these different you know, names being applied to, to what? It's enterprises or companies in general just looking for how do I optimize my IT infrastructure? And for a company like Vicinity, it, it's, it's literally almost like manna from heaven, to quote my CEO, uh, because there's so much data being generated in so many places. How, how do we process it? Where are we going to process it? And people are making those decisions based on the relationships with different cloud providers, but then maybe, you know, because of an acquisition, I've got stuff at Azure, I've got stuff at AWS. Oh, now I've got stuff in GCP. How do I make all of that work together? Well, what's the value of the work? It's insight from data for one part of a business process or another. We're able to connect those. We don't care which cloud it's in, whether that's public, private, uh, a colo, on-prem, doesn't matter to us. Our whole notion as a technology is to connect the computer, the users, to data wherever it sits. So the question that jumps in my head is, one, how hard it is to do that. It's a hard problem. And two, costs come up a lot. So I hear people, that's the nirvana. I'd love to just have my data accessible, highly available, and with high availability, kind of uh, multiple uh, perspectives. Um, but it's, it's a hard problem to solve. It is. And it can be costly. How do you respond to that? Well, uh, I mean, the, the big thing is, is that you're going to have to store the data somewhere. And so basing that on what is the most effective and from a cost, but also from a compute, right? How long does it take to process data? I mean, traditionally it's been, my data has got to be with the compute. So wherever that is, I have to pay for that storage, right? Um, I also have to then pay to move it to wherever that location is. I think you know, what we add to that equation is the put it anywhere and you won't care. Um, you don't want to have to egress data from a cloud provider, right? Paying by the drip is not a way to do that. So if you put it up there, 
you better be able to keep it there and only have to take out a little bit at a time as needed. Right? But what we see is a trend where more and more are actually deploying storage on-prem, but using burst compute to the cloud. Right? And that could be any of the number of clouds. Right? So. so this is the product I want to get into. So uh, talk about the vicinity product. How do people engage? What, how do they deploy it? How are they managing it today? Okay. How do you guys solve that problem? Because again, it is Nirvana. I can see that being in high demand. I want to have a nice clean environment for my data. I want it to grow. And I sure. want it to be useful. So what's the product? How does it deploy? And how do people consume? Sure, so we have a couple of products, right? But fundamentally it is software that's available in say the AWS or Azure Marketplace. We run in GCP, we're not in the marketplace per se. Um, and then we, and, and th that allows for us to do software only scale out types of solutions. And then we've got actual hardware assist technologies to scale up. So when people think about moving data fast over networks, they think you know, WAN optimizers, extreme file transfer technologies, um, none of them go up to 100 gig. We do, right? So, uh, and we do that using off the shelf PCIe cards that are you know, manufactured commercial product um, because they have FPGAs on them that we can leverage. And one of the benefits to that is that we're also now seeing a movement in the cloud providers, especially AWS and Azure, with exposing FPGA-based instances so that you can actually have specialized compute. Well, we leverage that to do specialized acceleration for data going into or out of those clouds. Now, the big thing right now that everyone's working on right now that's taking all the applications by storm is the app developer market. Okay, AI and machine learning, generative AI in particular, is transforming all businesses. How do you guys fit into that trend? How's that going for you guys? What's, what's in it for the customer? How do you pray that? Because again, data is critical for this workload that if we want to training and doing inference. Sure. So, I mean, our origin was actually in high performance computing, right? We, we originally did fabric extenders for InfiniBand networks, right? To move again, data over very long distances at, in, in, in big pipes. So what we see in the trend today is that a lot of those applications require that that data be moved to a, a large compute farm, right? Um, and to do that, it's a lot of data. And in, in a lot of cases, it, it's in different locations. So imagine if you could say, have data generated in five different spots that you want to run some AI workload against, uh, but you could do data fusion in real time because we can connect that compute to each of those different remote locations. Uh, real quick, to explain data fusion for the folks watching. Oh, data fusion in the sense that my, for my algorithm to be effective, right? Because I'm doing some kind of, I don't know, whether it's you know, graphical neural networking or whatever, whatever I'm working on, um, I actually have data that is not in one place right now. But I need to actually analyze all of that and bring it together, or fuse that data to be able to get an effective insight from that data. So as I work my model, my model has to account for different well, I wanted to do, just call that out because I think that is one of the trends that we're seeing the most of now. Using data at the right place at the right time is as part of the developer and the application. Correct. To do something that, it was, that, that either would be magical in an AI sense or something that's needed for the application. Which by the way, is hard to do. So that's a, a we're going to see more of that. Well, I, absolutely. And I mean, I just recently was working with someone who was debating using something on their home computer versus do I use uh, Colab on Google, on GCP, right? Who gives you a free GPU instance to work with as a data developer, right? And so I think we're just going to see that grow more and more where we're going to have you know, these GPU farms that yeah. are not going to have the data local though. What are they going to do? Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think ChatGPT was a great educator for everyone in the world to see sure. what AI could do as a use case, the frequency of that, of that regenerate this result. That's going to happen under the covers in the application. That's why data fusion is super, so important. And so first we're kind of in this evolution of let's get multi-cloud set up, let's get hybrid cloud set up. Now you got, the, that's like more platform as a service and with underlying infrastructure abstracted away. Now you have this next layer, the super cloud layer that's going to do smart things. Right. That's where the action is right now. How do you respond to that? And what is Vicinity doing there? Uh, the big thing for us is ensuring portability across all the different cloud architectures, if you will, right? Because A is not like B is not like C kind of thing, right? Um, and anyone who's worked with AWS or Azure or Google, they, they know, right? So how do we um, focus as we're doing, you know, the data developers, knowing that, you know, I want to be able to work across these different infrastructures. Right, so for us, 
um, and now for my product hat side of things, it's really about making products available that can actually touch each and one of those. Now remember, and for us it's about focusing on data accessibility, right? We're not trying to do data management. We're not trying to do some of the other more elaborate things that workflow management systems, MAMs, DAMs, things like that do, right? Um, but it is all about making sure we can access whatever is that next big infrastructure, right? And that's where the management comes in. It works together with what's available on a governance basis, and then you're making it accessible for stuff, app infrastructure, software, Correct. apps Correct. to integrate with. Because we sit below the application layer with our technology, we don't care what the application is, right? It's, it's, it's a novel position to be in, actually. So, of course, we love the AI, machine learning language. We think that's going to be a tsunami of new innovation, new creativity. Certainly, as data becomes accessible, there's going to be more new things emerging that we could never see before. So I think that this data openness is going to be a big thing, um, and thanks to you guys and others. But the question that comes up is, okay, you got me at accessibility. <laughs> okay, I love that. Now, security. The fear kicks in. How do we make it secure? What's the data security angle? Well, there's a couple of pieces to that, right? One is, as I said, we sit below the application layer, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't, we don't touch data. You know, one of the interesting things, I, I mentioned how fast we move data, but we don't compress it or dedupe it, right? Unlike you know, other like, WAN optimizer types of technologies. Um, think about what I said about our origins, right? DOD and IC world, they would give us encrypted data. Can't, can't touch it. So we had to figure out how to accelerate across the networks without ever you know, munging on the data. Uh, and, and that's what we've done. However, what we do is we were actually FIPS 140-2 certified in our transport across the wide area network. So we use standardized encryptions, right? We're, we're literally protected there. Um, and we've got some other deeper technologies I probably won't go too deep into, but we have the ability to do data obfuscation, send data across different paths, encrypt them uniquely, um, but we don't do anything that affects the rights that have already been assigned to that data at the user level. So things like ACLs and things like, we don't touch them, right? Mm -hmm. So whatever that is from the enterprise management side of things, um, if they're using AD or LDAP or something like that, we won't actually touch it. So you basically work with whatever existing Correct. security protocols Correct. are in place, but also of your own. What about data democratization, interoperability? Obviously, the, we're seeing a democratization of, of the revolution of data as it gets refactored, if you will. Snowflake, Databricks are two examples out there. Uh, others, working with multiple data providers is something that is going to come up a lot. How do you see that evolving? And how do you answer that super cloud data interoperability question? Well, the big one that I've seen so far has been um, organizations wanting to leverage object data that's sitting in S3 buckets, almost like they do file data, right? Uh, in, in fact, it's surprising me to hear that, you know, object storage was designed to be basically cheap and deep, right? I mean, that was the concept. Yeah. And so there was so much invested in that, but now people are realizing, oh my gosh, I put all this data into an S3 bucket and I now need it. I need it like I do file. So one of our big things is, uh, you know, vicinity fully supports being able to go from file to object, object to file. We have a cloud native technology that um, uh, we actually just announced uh, uh, about, I don't know, six weeks ago with Teradata to support their new network object storage, right? So that you can run cloud compute against an object store sitting on prem, right? Without having to do that. So we're, we're working towards how do we change formats, but fundamentally within the unstructured data world, right? Because when you start talking about the structured data world, the different database formats, there are other technologies out there that deal with a lot of that, right? But um, the problem in that arena is that they're all proprietary. Russ, it's great chatting with you um, on your product of accessibility is one of our core pillars of SuperCloud and that layer. Talk about Vicinity's value proposition. Where are you guys succeeding? Can you give some examples of uh, real life examples of how you're being deployed? What are the use sure. cases? Um, sure. Because you got the pioneers now probably using this and you know progressively pushing new architectures. It's pretty cool object and block having all that interoperability and this abstraction. Where are you winning? Where is it working? Can you share an example and just uh, anecdotal sure. data points? I can give you a couple of them real quick. Uh, big thing in terms of our value proposition are those that need to derive value from their data in a timely manner, right? So think time to insight, time to decision, time to act. So the federal government is still obviously a very big customer of ours. Um, 
And then on the commercial side, uh, I'll give you a couple quick ones. Uh, one of the big ones we just did with a cruise line was they needed to update uh, servers on a ship at sea. Satellites, low bandwidth, high latency. Um, they literally took a three gig file, moved it from shore to ship over that satellite. It took 16 hours. With us, it took 27 minutes. This is a huge difference, right? Um, we actually a ship's just, like a floating data center, it, basically. It absolutely is. It, it absolutely is. The people probably have no clue just how much <laughs> technology is on a, on a cruise That's ship. That's a story That's I'm going to work on with the team. We're going to go hit the cruise ship and, and do a I, deep I'm, dive. I'm happy to come with you. <laughs> happy to come with you. Um, okay, so continue. Right. Um, and so, actually, just data movement. Uh, as an example, we did a webinar with AWS uh, within the last two weeks here where they wanted to, they tested using our technology versus AWS, whatever they threw at it, um, to move various types of file formats, sizes, right? And so at the peak, doing very small files, like in the kilobyte range, we were 70 times faster than anything they were doing. Um, in the reality, the real world, uh, mostly people have mixed, small files, large files, whatever. We were basically about 12 times faster, right? This is public, this was you know, in a webinar. Um, but the biggest thing, when I look at the people that want to do this, you know, especially AI, ML kind of stuff remotely. We did an oil and gas concern between Brazil and Houston, where they moved one terabyte of a subsea scan uh, over a two gig link and, uh, with another vendor I won't name, uh, and it took them just over 16 hours and 15 minutes roughly, right? And that's not bad. They used us over a one gig link and it took two hours and 15 minutes. But what they did after that was they ran the application from Brazil against the data that they had just moved to, to Houston over that same one gig link. And they ran the application and got their result in 18 minutes. Why move the data? Yeah, this is exactly the point. I think you bring optionality Correct. to the companies deploying large data and changing data now. Just look at the, the how hard it is to get GPUs these days or stand up, say, physical infrastructure for AI, for instance. I, I won't say who told me this, but I was at an event recently where <laughs> someone told me that they did a, 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 a number in the Bs on a pre-buy, pre-paid to NVIDIA to get allocation because the allocation is that tight. Yeah, I, I think we reported on that uh, story. But anyway, this is the point. The uh, supply chain on hardware, Amazon's got some nice sustainability goals. The clouds are working at scale. So the cost to push it and get benefit, if done right, is a new architecture. It's not like it was around before. So the old Correct. model of data movement was, well, let's not move the data, that's too expensive in and out of the cloud. You can just keep it there. That's what you guys are saying. We, we don't care where it's at. You can literally keep it on-prem, in your colo, in the cloud. Doesn't actually matter to us. Bottom line for the folks watching, what's super cloud going to look like in a year or two, five years? Now that you have an accelerated AI push, which will force applications, to the market, I think we're going to see both the physical layer get smarter, obviously, at the hardware level, but as the, the super apps are coming out that have AI built in, generative AI and other cool things, where we're expecting an acceleration. What do you expect to see uh, the super cloud architecture evolve to? Wow, so it's, a, it's an interesting question. Um, I expect to see it extend all the way to the far edge. I, I fully expect that what we what we think of as cloud today are large data centers sitting in Ashburn or Oregon or wherever, right, or here in the valley. Um, there is going to be such heavy compute pushed out to edges simply to, mm. because there's going to be data that needs processing in microseconds. But then there's also going to be the larger result of that that needs to be fused, combined, uh, and assessed that's going to take hours, weeks, months, right? So I think what we're going to find is um, with the decreasing cost for bandwidth, you're going to start seeing those connections yes. go further and further out. It's interesting, supercomputing, you mentioned eight, um, high performance computing, HPC mm -hmm. earlier. That's been around for a while, to, uh, very expensive by the way to do. I think super cloud's going to be, things that are going to, were hard once to do and expensive mm -hmm. to do are going to get in more inexpensive, not cheaper, but more less cost and that's going to enable new things to happen. For example, real time data. Sure. As real time becomes important, you're going to start to see that mixed with analytical previous data. So fusion's going to happen. So I think more of that's going to happen at scale, which was hard to do and expensive just 10 years ago. 
Very much so. I mean, if you think about what's even happening in, say, retail, for example, right? Computer vision has changed everything. Now I want to deploy at least enough compute to my store, especially a superstore, where I can do analytics against live video in real time locally, but I still want to and need to process all of that data for other purposes, right? For bigger marketing or security, Take, pick your subject, right? Russ, great to have you on SuperCloud 3 keynote conversation. Thanks for coming on, appreciate it. It's a pleasure, thank you for having me, John. This is theCUBE, SuperCloud 3 keynote conversation with Russ Davis, Chief Operating Officer and Chief Product Officer of Vicinity. Changing the game, making data available. This is what developers will want. This is the future. This is what SuperCloud will emerge and enable. And uh, you got it all here in theCUBE coverage. We'll be back with more coverage of SuperCloud 3 event after this short break. <laughs>